gone. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Cabinet meeting held on the Thursday, the 26th of October, uh, 2023. Um, first item on the agenda is, are there any apologies? <clears throat> yeah, we have two item, two cabinet members sending apologies, which is Councillor Jay and Councillor Cooper. Item two, we move swiftly on to the minutes of the previous two meetings, which were held on the 31st of August 2023 and the 27th, 28th of September 23. Uh, these have been duly published, uh, so I don't see any amendments, so I'm looking for somebody to uh, move and second them. All those in favour? Thank you. <clears throat> our next item on our agenda is to de declare any uh, interests, declaration of interest of any members. Um, are there any declarations of interest? No, that's all good. Thank you. Uh, Item four is question time to receive any questions from the members of public in pursuit of executive procedure rule number 13. I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Moving on. Um, item five is matters referring to the cabinet, referred to the cabinet in accordance with the overview and scrutiny of rules, scrutiny procedure rules. Um, which are on page 13 to 16. Um, I was happy to be at that, that uh, meeting where it was proposed that um, we would that um, have cro cross-party um, involvement uh, in, in, you know, in, in the budget scrutiny setting up um, group. Um, I have actually uh, taken time to consider what may or may not be the implications of uh, this um, this proposal. But first, I'd like Danny to have a few moments. Councillor Cook. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you again for attending our meeting uh, of the last corporate scrutiny where one of the items obviously was uh, budget pressures on Tamworth Borough Council. I thought it was an exceptional good debate from all angles of the chamber, some fantastic input from officers and I think we've all got a very clear picture cross party of where the finances are currently at Tamworth Borough Council. As you'll recall, uh, two recommendations came out of that meeting for consideration by Cabinet. Uh, the first, that cross-party, uh, we write to government, obviously setting out uh, our position and obviously looking for further clarity longer term of how our uh, finances will sit. Uh, we all know the tragedy that a lot of the reliance on our finances is actually set by government, whether that be what percentage of the business rates we keep, how much we're allowed to or not allowed to increase council tax by, and obviously other grants, sections of certain business rates, uh, Section 151 uh, rules where obviously certain things come back through uh, to meet new burdens through business rates. But so much of the control is still with government. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we have not lobbied going on our finances since 2020. And I, uh, basically, I think the committee felt it was about time that cross party, given our current makeup, we write to government setting out, you know, what our challenges are and to see what the feelings are from a government angle. I know that's potentially a complicated thing in a year leading up to general election because nobody knows what's going to happen after a general election. But I think personally, and I think the committee agreed that it is time we lobby government again about our current financial position. We know there are councils a lot worse off than us, some closer than others, uh, but yep, it's certainly time. And the second one was, given the current makeup of the council and the pressures we're facing, uh, that actually the three scrutiny chairmen be invited to take part in budget discussions um, to make it a more cross-party feel. Uh, obviously, I think that personally brings the benefit of um, if the other parties are massively involved in the conversations, 
Uh, obviously, we don't get to the end of February with budgets being rejected, given the makeup of the council, which would be an absolute disaster for this council to reject a budget. I think you get about four days to actually fix the problem if you reject a budget, and then the trouble you would be in with government if you don't fix that in four days. I think some cross-party work from that point, obviously accepting Cabinet as the right to set the budget, but if the three scrutiny chairs could be invited just to be involved in the conversations, it, it removes the risk, I believe, of that budget being rejected in February. That's not a threat. Please don't take it. Please don't take it that way. It just means that all parties are involved before we get to those final stages, which means we find out any issues and this budget should travel because of all the things that's important for this council, that budget has to pass. And I know that after enough years there. And that's why I think the recommendation moves to Chairman. Uh, you were certainly there, and obviously happy to take any questions or I'm obviously happy to listen to your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, I'll open it to any other members of the cabinet before I uh, reply. Has anybody got anything to say? No. Yeah, um, <clears throat> in principle, writing to the government, not a problem. I think we're, you know, we're all aware of particularly um, the recent events where we all know there is a, a real shortage of auditors that are signing off government books. And that's a big issue for us to actually tell the constituents, yes, ours are all in good order, uh, and I know that behind the scenes and from my work as Chair of Audit and Governance, Tamworth is really well audited, policed and governed. But going forward, I think you're right. The, the certainty and the ability to try and plan over a three-year budget when we're only given revenues from... Uh, the government over a year is always a challenge for all, or not just this organisation, but we would be for any. So I do think that you're right in, in a lot of respects when you say, open it up a little bit. And, and you're also right that listening uh, over and looking over the last 10, 11 years of how we've set the budget, and that, as you, you, you know, um, alluded to earlier, that it comes down to like four days. Really, that's not fair on the... Um, <clears throat> the CEO and, and, and the financial team to, to, to sort of have only you know, a few days to react when we all know we've started the process now. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, I've had a lot of time to have a think about this. And in principle, having three scrutiny chairs invited to the budget setting group has a lot of merits. My own concerns is how we deliver that in practice, that that doesn't cause additional procrastination debate that then puts more pressure that four days so i'm trying to get my head around what are the actual practical strategically it's great practical what we can't do is have another committee working on another committee that delays stuff so i just need to try and get more clarity uh, uh, from yourself about how this budget setting group would function so I think that, in principle, I'm open to listening and organising and making us all better. So, you know, it's, not, it's, it's certainly not a criticism, Danny. But I really need to think a bit more detail. And I think <clears throat> maybe it's a piece of work that we look at a bit more detail, give it a bit more thinking, and we perhaps implement after this year's budget. Because I just don't want to delay the process. I hear what you're saying. So I just think we need a bit more time, and perhaps perhaps the three the three scrutiny chairs can do a piece of work and come back with a bit more data before we say what what are the terms of reference of the group, how things are moved forward through that group, what's the what are the agendas, and what's the actual uh, targets and goals of that group. So that's just my thoughts, and I'm thinking well, great in principle. Is it the right time now to implement and introduce that? I, I, I welcome your feedback. Yeah, I, I think, um, as I alluded to in my introduction, the building blocks of the budget are the responsibility of Cabinet, and nobody's looking to get involved in that. Yeah. I think the scrutiny chairman is to create a cross-party feel, given no overall control, is that we are briefed at each stage with you guys, yeah. right? You will still be having your conversations with officers as cabinet members. So 
in the housing side and the HRI Sam will still be talking to Rob and looking at the challenges and getting the information together and building it and putting the proposals together. I don't think the three scrutiny chairmen are looking to come to, into this process to make proposals or get in the way. They're looking to understand it at every stage. So we don't get to February when all of a sudden there might be a massive political fallout and nobody wants that. We're looking just to be involved in the conversations with you guys when you actually sit as a group and understand what is going on to ensure that we smooth it up to next February. I don't think I'm sitting here. I'm not going to sit here and say to you, from my perspective, I've got a ton of policies I want to throw into it because I haven't. And I don't think I will have one. I can't speak for Carol and Chris at that point, obviously, but I think we're looking to be involved in the conversation to understand it as it's built. And if we go away and do a piece of work now, we've missed the window. So that, that's our request. Can we just be involved in the conversations? I don't think we're sitting here saying we want to wrestle it away from cabinet because that's not how this council functions. I think that's the best way I can answer that. Yeah, thanks for your clarity. I mean, that's, that was my, my um, you know, just thoughts of how does it actually work in, in practice? It's all right saying we'll set a group up and we're open. We said right from the day one, this new cabinet, this new um, side of the, the house, for want of a better word, is that prepared to listen. We, we are not the front of all knowledge. We, we appreciate support and welcome the, the, your, your comments and your, your direction. And you're right that over the three brains of the scrutiny chairs may come up that next year we have, oh, why didn't we do that? So I'm open to that. So you're right. I mean, cabinet's cabinet. It will do what it's got to do and we'll get this lot through. I was just I was a little bit cautious to think before we implement something like this, what is the downside? What could be an unforeseen consequence? So having informal conversations in a group of that and discussing it as this process, I have no problem with that. Yeah. I think perhaps pro approaching it from different angles of caution, but I think actually we're heading in the same direction, Mr Chairman, if we actually think yeah. about it. Historically, and I'm not sure we'd do it as such a formal process anymore, but we had historically our budget review group. But it was never constituted because those conversations have to be almost protected. Yeah. You know, setting a budget that involves you know 400 staff pulling it out of the air is a complicated process. And to protect those staff and protect the budgets and protect the services, yeah. there has to be a, a confidentiality and a safety net to it. Yeah. So I'm not asking for a formally constituted committee where the scrutiny chairs are given any power. I'm looking for a regularly set up, maybe every few weeks with this process, where the three scrutiny chairmen are called in you guys just for us to be updated. So we understand as the process unfolds. And if we've got any tantrums now, we get them out of the way now. Exactly. I know, but it doesn't take away from me of cabinet setting the budget because that is cabinet's role and we can't get in the way of that role. I'm sure Mr. Barnes from an HRA perspective and these two great guys next to him don't want to have three different conversations on where the HRA is going because it'll just fall apart, won't it? It, it can't happen. So yeah, I think what we're asking for is an informal conversation on probably say two to three week basis through the process with the cabinet, and maybe a couple of officers to say, where are we? How do we get there? What's the roadblocks? You know, and if we start to see anything that's going to, from a different political angle, start to block it, we can shift them now. That's, I think, what we're asking for. We're not asking for any power, if that's what you're fearful of. <laughs> Don't, unless I communicated uh, wrongly, it was never about the power. It's about the detail of what it is. And I just didn't want the process to be procrastinating where the three scrutinies, we all have the worst case scenario, lockheads, lock horns, and so you can't move forward. And then these guys are really um, up against the eight, you know, the, the, the eight ball. And we don't want that. We, 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 we're all grown up. We know where we're going with this. The budget process is, is, is what it is. And it's challenging. And this year may be even more challenging than normal. Um, yes. So, no, I appreciate that. I just wanted to, I just thought about it. I'm, I'm quite cautious, really, in change and how we do it and why we do it. So I have no problem in updating you lot regularly. Um, and likewise, the feedback that you come from that, whether that's an informal email or a conversation over a coffee somewhere, maybe that's the best way. But in principle, no problem. I, th I think um, fr from our perspective, Mr Chairman, with your permission, if we agree the cross-party right into government with our issues and problems and challenges and our opportunities, obviously, yeah. we agree that. And obviously, we put in the diary updates, whether that's with the whole of cabinet or just with yourself, with the three screen chairs, yeah. to iron out any future issues, I think we'd be comfortable. Like I said, we're not looking for a constituted committee that brings some power our way. I've, I've sat in your chair long enough to know how ridiculous that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I propose, as leader, 
I'll feed back to that, that, those three individuals on a regular basis. We'll set the dates and the diaries and how we do it. Um, and then, obviously, as we get feedback from uh, the 151 officer and the team and the, the, the CEO, um, as this budget changes or you know evolves as to be the complete work, at the moment we just put all the ingredients in the pot and we haven't made the cake yet. But we're on, we're on a we know where the cake is going to come from. So yes, no problem. I will feed back to you. We'll sit down, all three of us and four of us, and then we'll. That, sir, I believe is called two serious politicians ironing out and getting somewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny, uh, Councillor Cook. Um, that's all put to bed. Um, the next item is item five, which is matters referred to the cabinet in accordance with the overview and scrutiny procedure. Oh, no, I've just done that one, haven't I? Sorry, I should have ticked it. Uh, our next item. Well, we are now moving into the uh, Councillor Sam Smith show. So item number six, <laughs> several more are in, in your capable hands. Thanks, Danny. I feel like there might be a trend tonight. So yeah, so we've got the um, local plan issues and um, options consultation responses. Um, so we've got, yeah, that's on agenda item six, page 17. So um, I believe Andrew Barrett is gonna go a little bit over this. Um, but all I was gonna say was that uh, next week we've got a local plan working group. Um, so that's that's been set up. So a lot of this in terms of the direction um, for the next review, uh, that, will in, that will be embedded within that working group. Um, but essentially we, we've had a big consultation um, uh, and you know, there's lots of data as you, as you can probably see. Um, and we need to move on from that, taking that into consideration um, while um, considering the changes to the regulatory position with the levelling up and all the rest. So that's kind of where we are with that. And um, if that's OK, I'll just hand over to uh, Andrew Parrott. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think you've actually summed it up quite succinctly. Uh, in reality, this is... Um, asking Cabinet to approve publication of the, uh, the responses uh, following the first stage of the consultation process, which Cabinet approved back in September last year. Um, in total, we um, received, I think, 47 consultation responses from a variety of uh, stakeholders, and these have all been collated into sort of into thematic groups. These will be fed into the discussion process as part of our local plan making, which, as members will know, is a, is a key document for, for the organisation. Um, and it's a key strategic document because obviously it, it's likely to be uh, in, in effect until 2020, 2046. So it's some, some considerable time. Um, when we reviewed our current local plan back in 2020 it was determined um, that while that plan uh, is in accordance with national policy and is performing uh, well against that um, a number of changes are required to ensure continuous compliance so uh, at that point in time it was deemed that we uh, we should start with uh, with production of our, our local plan so this is one of the foundation stones of of that um, of that process and, and that review so the consultation responses are attached um, to the report as appendix a um, and they will be considered by the local plan working group and the uh, the, the planning officers um, in the formation of the policy uh, and we're asking cabinet to endorse publication of those responses to, um, to, to, to the wider public and stakeholders and also delegating authority to um, the Assistant Director of Growth and Regeneration just to make any final sort of typographical and or formatting changes to this document prior to, to publication. So it is, it's a housekeeping report in a way just to enable us to take this to the next stage. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, 
Yes, well, as, as it, uh, you know, as you said, it, 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 the, the purpose of this uh, this report is to seek cabinet approval to publish the local plan issues and options uh, consultation responses. So it is that the, re the recommended that the cabinet approve the publication of the local plan issues and option consultation responses as included in Appendix A and the Cabinet delegate authority to the Assistant Director of Growth and Generation to make any final typographic or formatting amendments prior to its publication. And I'm looking for somebody to move, somebody to second that. Thank you. Have you got that? Uh, all those in favour? Thank you. Our next item is to move on to item eight, uh, which is an update. Is that the one? Uh, seven. Uh, item seven, which is the environment funds within the housing capital programme. Again, this is in the capable of the hands of our councillor Sam Smith. Thank you, Chair. So this, this is the environment of funds within housing capital programmes. Um, just be aware it's not in the main reports back. This is um, uh, as, as a sort of uh, Follow up, I guess, um, on the overall agenda. So you'll see that on the front sheet if you haven't got it. Um, yeah, so I'll pass you over to um, Paul Weston for this one, if that's okay. Yeah, and this is uh, this this report looks to via funds within the capital programmes uh, to cover some uh, un unanticipated overspends uh, within a capital project. Uh, the project relates to the renewal of soil pipes within the high-rise blocks. Uh, it's a uh, project that's sort of taken place over multiple financial years. Uh, quite a large, complex project, uh, and unfortunately there has been some unforeseen works in there that uh, effectively have been identified as we've proceeded with the contract. Uh, the nature of the works that were on site meant that we couldn't stop those works because they were actually removal of uh, the internal soil pipes which take all the waste through the building. Uh, and in many areas we were finding things as we were opening up the building. So again, there weren't stuff, there wasn't stuff that was visible as you, you know, in any sort of pre-survey pre work. Uh, it was found when we were sort of starting to open up not helped by the fact that of the six blocks one has a slightly different design that wasn't anticipated until we started knocking holes in walls uh, the nature of the project like I say because it was over uh, multiple financial years there wasn't sufficient contingency built into that project uh, to cover all the additional costs it wasn't practical to suspend work due to the nature of the the project uh, therefore we have run into that overspend situation uh, where the project is over the anticipated budget but rather than overspend across the entire budget what we've looked at is where there are savings uh, that can be made elsewhere within the capital programs to offset that so it sets out where those projects are uh, the high-rise shoot renewals were completed and those works are done with a saving so some of the some of the costs have been met through there and again the ventilation uh, there's been some changes around regulation on that so that's a different project now and again, there's some savings there to be bought through from it. Uh, so re really, that sort of covers it off. And I think, you know, for, for us, the key key factor to take away for, from it is on significant large projects of this nature where, I suppose, unforeseen or foreseeable, uh, where we, we could reasonably anticipate that there's going to be sort of complexities that will result in additional costs, is around looking at how we're building sort of future contingency into those programmes to ensure that we, we have sufficient contingency within the agreed budget uh, that potentially, if, if not needed, would then be offered up at savings as opposed to having to deal with environments sort of post-completion of works. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, uh, over to you, Sam. Yeah, I was just going to say, if there's anything to take away from this, um, well, first of all, uh, we have an attached um, little document there for the asbestos. Um, I think, you know, generally we probably need to consider um, going forward. You know, actually, what are the what what are the conditions that mean that asbestos is considered? I think we need to understand that these sorts of works possibly um, are going to be contaminated with this stuff. So. 
we need to think about that potentially more when we're when we're factoring the the budgeting for it um because i feel like this can be something that happens in other areas as well um and you know we just want to make sure that it's not necessarily a surprise um from the financial angle um yeah and 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 really i mean what we're talking about here is 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 an overspend to be covered by um, a future next year budget um so that's kind of the bottom line on that one thank you chair thank you um glasses on the recommendations um, uh, well the purpose of it as has already been stated that um that it is recommended that the cabinet agree with the environment funds of our existing over underspend budgets within 23 24 for the capital are set out below and and the numbers are there so i'm looking for the cabinet to move and second that all those in favor thank you Right, our next item, again, is in the hands of Councillor Sam, uh, Sam Smith. <laughs> Just one moment. Right, we're back. <laughs> Just trying to find that, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is the this is the leaseholder report, um, which obviously, you know, started uh, as announced in the strategic review at the end of August, um, and as I further mentioned at the last corporate scrutiny meeting. Um, so I believe Paul Weston will, will go over this, however, <coughs> Um, I just wanted to talk about the some of the areas within the scope of what this review will actually um, seek out because I think it is quite important um, given the uh, conversation around this um, and to ensure that any of those that are currently listening potentially or will listen in from YouTube um, are aware of what's included. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was before going through it is during the review, there clearly might well be stuff that hasn't necessarily been thought about, which will arise. And we have ensured that if there are um, additional issues that aren't on the original scope, um, that um, uh, that further investigation of that issue 
will continue and won't be hampered by this original scope. I think that is important to mention um, to alleviate any concerns. So yeah, just a few, just some, just some areas within the scope. Um, so um, identification of works and planned programs. The review will assess the current approach for selecting properties for inclusion in planned works program. Additionally, it will examine the pros and cons of maintaining the planned renewals program in contrast to a reactive and continuous repairs program. The review will scrutinize the existing approach to the S20 consultation process, encompassing an examination of the documentation, the timing of notices, the language used in notices, and the compliance with current legislation. All issue documentation will be thoroughly ad addressed with recommendations for potential improvements. The report will offer a comprehensive analysis of the current state of compliance with relevant le le legislative and regulatory requirements. Uh, the independent consultant will collaborate with officers to develop an updated suite of communication tools. These tools will complement the statutory legal notices and aim to ensure that leaseholders are well informed about planned works. They will include expl explanations of the necessary necessity of works, breakdowns of costs and details of methods of rep representation and appeal. While reviewing the entire process, the independent consultant should be able to identify any existing procedural issues and propose suitable rem remedies where applicable. Uh, we'll also examine the procurement and contract pricing. Um, there's also a review of the data and its use, um, including the examination of data utilised by the Council in the formulation of planned works programmes that affect leaseholder properties. This review will assess the comprehensiveness and suitability of the data and will also include the co uh, comparative analysis of how Tamworth Borough Council's data management practices align with those of similar social housing uh, providers. Um, as part of the review, a focused technical assessment will be conducted on 21 roofs, um, which will have which have been the catalyst for the review process. Uh, this assessment will include any evaluation of the remaining lifespan, the necessary repair and maintenance of work, and the development of a comprehensive whole life cost model, comparing the expenses associated with renewal versus ongoing repair and maintenance, which of course is very important. The independent consultant will also offer guidance and assistance on how the condition data can be effectively utilised to inform leaseholders about the required work for their specific property interests. Additionally, they will provide insight into the practical and cost implications of conducting a detailed assessments and surveys of all properties to obtain in-depth condition data that can support their inclusion in various programmes. Uh, we've got a couple of impact assessments uh, to be included, one on the leaseholders, uh, which will encompass the evaluation of capital costs, ongoing operational expenses, and potential impact to value of leaseholder assets. Uh, the focus will be on that, and also the uh, review um, on the suitability and efficacy of the existing statement of means utilised to facilitate payment, payment plans for leaseholders in tandem with this a thorough examination of the legal framework and suitable terms for payment plans will be considered and addressed. Uh, the other impact plan uh, assessment, sorry, is on the business plan, the HRA business plan. Um, and then we've also got a review of any of the FTT uh, rulings. And then just to conclude on this, um, we've got time scale. Now, obviously, what has been mentioned, uh, what I mentioned originally at full council at the end of August was a six to 12 month timeline. Um, the general uh, acknowledgement here is that given the current resources that we have, um, it might well, and we've, we've proposed a maximum um, time here of 12 months. However, what we'd be looking to achieve uh, early next year is really, um, you know, the, the, the beginnings of the conclusion to this matter. We don't want to rush this um, because we don't want to miss anything and we want to make sure the uh, review is, is full and detailed. Um, at the same time though, of course, uh, there's a lot, lot of apprehension um, between leaseholders and, of course, uh, members within the council as well. So, you know, we, we, we want to go as quickly as we can, but we don't want to um, miss anything out, um, given, you know, how long this whole entire subject has been going on for years, of course. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the idea with the time scale. Um, we've got up to 12 months, but we, we want to try and see if we can... Um, complete it uh, sooner if possible. So yeah, those are some um, 
points I've just sort of plucked out from the scope. I just thought it was important going through those because it really kind of gets to the heart of really of what we're doing, uh, at the heart of what the strategic review is actually about. Um, so yeah, that's where we are at the moment. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Paul, Rob, do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Smith. I mean, I think, obviously, it's a two-part report, really, I suppose, to some degree. Uh, there's the procurement exercise around the strategic review, which I think Councillor Smith just really gone into the detail of the actual scope of that, which is probably not a great deal to add to it, to be honest with you, from there, because really the rest of it is just the process. Uh, just to say, I think the tender date, return date is the 6th of November. Uh, so, and there is interest in that contract, so we know, so we know there is interest in providing that service. So we fully anticipate to be able to award a, a contract on that. Uh, and we will be looking to sort of engage with uh, certainly Councillor Smith in terms of the selection process around that. Uh, the second part of the report really is around the corporate scrutiny recommendations and just an update on those. Uh, I won't go through the detail on there's the table there, which sort of picks up on the various recommendations that were made on the 23rd of February. It provides an update on progress against those however I think it's probably worth recognising that an awful lot of those will be superseded by the outcome of that review in any case uh, uh, because I think you know realistically the, the review the purpose of the review is to seek to address those is issues that were raised uh, also worth noting of course that the uh, the stage three notices that were in play have formally been uh, withdrawn so leaseholders are aware of that uh, and I think we just made it clear in that that it doesn't prevent us from doing works if we have to. So if there's a, an absolute urgent need to do that works, we can. Uh, however, I think it was also worth uh, raising that sort of message that based on the inspections that have been done to date, there was no indication that any roofs were in any immediate structural danger. I think the, the issue was always the age of the roofs is such that, you know, they are more prone to... Uh, re requiring repair uh, through sort of you know just the normal wear and tear as opposed to anything structural. Uh, other than that, I think you know we, we'll we'll go through the process of the strategic review and that will result in a report that will no doubt come back through this this group uh, and probably <coughs> through the scrutiny committee uh, with a view for how we actually go through the implementation of that. Uh, clearly, there will have to be some costings attached to it because you know changes in process could could come with costs uh, and we'll need to address those uh, but like I say I think the view will, will be that once we've got that report we can present that and again I think the timeline is sort of set out in there that we anticipate at the moment and this is the timeline we've put to uh, bidders again that could change once we actually really start getting into the sort of the the detail uh, you know if some areas require more e exploration that could change that time scale, uh, but again, we can report back on that as and when. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to say uh, well done to everybody for all their hard work and um, efforts to date. Uh, it's always good when you've got, um, uh, you know, I call it a challenge, but an opportunity as well to just say, let's put the brakes on things. Let's just have a complete look at it. Lots of water has gone under that bridge. And, and for all of us to make um, correct strategic uh, decisions, sometimes you've just got to start and say, let's review it. Things have changed. We may need to uh, you know, re refocus our attention in a, in a different priority, in a different way. Uh, so I do thank you and your team for all the extra work that this is, obviously the review has caused, but I'm sure that it will be better for the um, constituents that are really going to be a, suffering at the moment, but benefiting in the, in the longer term. And we're going to make sure that it's right, right for everybody. You know, I know that the intentions of the council and all us councillors is, is to do well for and do good for Tamworth. So th this, is, this is great. Uh, before I um, uh, propose for uh, a mover and second on the recommendations, I'd like to ask any of the cabinet members that's here tonight any more comments or... Observations. Right, uh, with that in mind then, it is um, this report is provides an update of the current situation of the leaseholder service charges and set out in de set out the details and the programme of the strategic review of this um, the, cha the charges. 
uh, and it is uh, recommended that the committee, the cabinet, endorses the actions to date. Uh, the cabinet endorses the strategic review procurement brief process, uh, procurement pro procurement brief, the procurement process, and the project timetable. Table. And the cabinet delegates authority to the portfolio holder for housing and planning, along with the assistant directors, to initiate stage three consultations and apply for service works for to pertain the urgent matters, health and safety or compliance. This action requires the approval of the portfolio hold uh, of housing and planning. A little bit of a mouthful, but there's the recommendations, and I'm looking for members of the cabinet to move and second it. <coughs> Thank you for that. All those in favour? Thank you. The, the recommendations are moved. Yes, uh, again, uh, item 10 is social housing regulatory programme. This is over to... Item oh, council housing annual report, uh, and this is in Councillor Smith's portfolio. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> sure is. So um, before I hand over to uh, Tina, um, just want to mention that we do have some recommendations. Um, Recommendation one, approve the draft council housing tenants <coughs> annual report 22-23 for circulation. It's all council tenants via the council's website as required by the regulator of social housing <coughs> to support the effectiveness or the effective scrutiny by tenants of the landlord's performance. Just to mention, just a, just a quick observation on that one. Um, just to be sure, um, the report is known as Annual Report for Tenants 2022-23. Um, so slight variation there, but that's essentially what we're recommending. And the second recommendation is to delegate the authority to the portfolio holder for social housing and homelessness prevention. And you'll notice that was the old portfolio name. <clears throat> so I believe we do have to amend that um, to reflect the new portfolio name, which of course is housing and planning. And um, again, in that particular recommendation, um, we are referring to the annual report for tenants 2022-23. Um, just so you know. So yeah, that's the only amendment on those recommendations in recommendation to just the portfolio holder title just to be absolutely exact <laughs> and uh recommendation three is, is is fine which i'm sure will be read out um at the end um and that's kind of all from me if i can pass back thank you. i now uh, invite tina to uh, have a moment <laughs> thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, so, yeah, apologies for the portfolio holder name. I mean, this is the 13th um, annual report that we've produced. So when we look back at the original portfolio holder, it was actually for vulnerable people in, to improve the quality of life. So that shows the the raft of um, involvement over the last 13 years. So as the portfolio holder for housing and planning has kindly said, this report seeks approval for our draft annual report reflecting the services to all our council housing tenants. As I've said, it's the 13th and it spotlights and showcases our compliance with the regulator of social housing's consumer standards, which are detailed in full in the report and also part of a, uh, Appendix A, which sets out um, from a tenant perspective, and they've been involved in its production, how we're meeting those. It also shares with you the latest consumer standard review that's published annually by the regulator, and it details in the report how we've seen an increase in areas of non-compliance, and I'm delighted to say that Tamworth's not in that position, um, and we are offering um, high quality services across those consumer standards to our to our tenants. Um, so I think in terms of the recommendations, as Councillor Smith has said, 
it's about approving the draft uh, annual report, it's delegating authority for any final amendments um, in conjunction with our tenant consultative group who are involved in its production um, and it's acknowledging that continued approach to consumer regulation. So thank you Chair, thank you Councillor Smith. Thank you Tina. Uh, yes, um, apart from those uh, small amendments to the type in, um, you know, the, the recommendations are straightforward really that the Cabinet do approve the draft, uh, delegate authority uh, to the portfolio holder and acknowledgement that the uh, findings contained within the Consumer Regulation Review. Uh, again, I'll swiftly ask for Cabinet members, are there any questions before we move and second them? No. Hello? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the table of figures and um, there are a few things that pop out and concern me, but um, uh, one that's crept up significantly is the average time between the council, uh, letting council properties, and that's leapt significantly from 15 days in 2018-19 to 52 days currently. So, I mean, in particular, what's been done to address that? So in terms of the um, production of that information around the key performance indicators, so that's going to be part of the regulator's um, ongoing monitoring and assessment. Um, but in terms of that turnaround time, probably do you want to add anything, Paul, in terms of that, in terms of the performance around Equans? Yeah, I mean, I think we're sort of finding a number of uh, complexities with the voids at the moment. Uh, there are some contractor performance issues that we need to address, and we know that. Uh, what we're also finding is that a lot of the voids are coming at quite a high cost at the moment uh, due to the condition they've been returned to us. Uh, and as we've, I think we've sort of uh, spoken about at previous committee <laughs> meetings, at, certainly at scrutiny, uh, the, the amount of time that a void takes is based on the cost of doing the void works. Uh, and when those voids come back to us in poor condition, uh, it can push that time time frame up, and I think you know when we look at the lower cost voids, which were probably within the anticipated cost envelope for a void works, they're probably still a little bit higher than they should be, but not considerably. I think where the way those averages start to push out is on those high cost voids, and I think that's something we are looking at and looking at addressing 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 those, and also working with sort of colleagues on the landlord side. Uh, because some of that relates to the way that those properties are handed back by tenants. Yeah, um, no, I, I understand it. I mean, over five years, it's quite a stark change in figures. Um, you know, I mean, are, are we saying our tenants aren't treating their houses as well as they were five years ago? I don't know, but I mean, it's uh, it seems to be that way. Uh, if that's the case but yeah it, it is I mean when we've got quite a few people on the housing register and we've already done what we can to shed the lower bands that um, you know didn't necessarily need housing on an urgent basis um, that that's that's a little worrying for me 52 days um, in between uh, you know for a turnaround but that that's all I'm really concerned about I mean you've got other things in terms of the repairs as well gradually taking a decline um, on customer satisfaction although the participants have gone down slightly um, but yeah that that when we've got people who are homeless effectively couch surface surfing and whatnot and, and looking to move into properties 52 days is a long time um, for, for people to be waiting massive stark contrast there I'm just uh, it just concerns me quite a bit Chair, if I could, I mean, just for reassurance of Cabinet, obviously there, there are a number of reasons why those performance figures have shifted, and um, I think we've sort of touched the surface on those tonight. Um, just for your reassurance, obviously, in terms of contractor issues, those that we have an improvement plan in place with the contractor, um, you know, that, that a lot of work is going into ensuring that that area of performance improves. There certainly is an issue in terms of the um, the, the actual value of um, works required on void properties has increased exponentially. Lots of reasons for that, one of which is you know, the condition that they're left in. It's also um, related to um, an increase in terms of the standards that we're required to meet. Um, what, what I would say, just as a final sort of add-on to this, so we are doing the work around sort of trying to make sure that performance improves. We also welcome the opportunity to work with um, scrutiny committees and through the social housing and homelessness prevention 
um, uh, board to, to look specifically at these areas of, of work. Um, so there is a lot of work going on to, to deal with those, um, those issues. So I just wanted to provide that reassurance that we're certainly not sort of complacent around these figures and recognise that these are, these are areas that need to improve one way or another. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, <clears throat> I think the issue of voids and turnaround have, have, have sort of been highlighted um, in recent months. Um, I know Health and Wellbeing, um, who was raised during that scrutiny meeting. I think there's more detail that we need to kind of um, get into. We need to unpack it a little bit more, maybe break it down so it's more understandable. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, through this, through that committee, um, which I can be a part of, you know, and um, uh, the housing and homeless advisory panel. Um, yeah, we'll be hopefully seeing some more answers on that um, to get to the bottom and hopefully improve on it. Thank you, Councillor, and uh, thank you for your your response and reactions. And I think it's right that, uh, as Councillor uh, Summers rightly pointed out, that if there is a trend that's going in the wrong way, it's nice to see that we're capturing the data. And now we need to really detail what the data is, identify the concerns and put an action plan in to try and address those, you know, that trend. Uh, and as Councillor uh, Smith has just said, uh, you know, through the relevant committee, we can start to drill that down in more detail and look forward to that trend or those 52 days being reduced over certainly the next quarter and six months and whatever it takes. So <clears throat> again, thank you for the, the work and the, the, the report. Um, and the recommendations which I've already previously read out so uh, without further ado I'm looking for them to this report to be moved and seconded thank you uh, and uh, no. now all those in favour thank you Right, moving uh, swiftly on to item number 10, which is our social housing regulatory performance report. And again, this is in capable hands of Councillor Sam Smith. Again, this report is um, authored by uh, Tina Mustafa, and um, I will um, uh, forward uh, this to her to uh, provide the detail. All I'd say is, I mean, given the regulations, um, that the bill that's obviously going well has gone through essentially uh, and we're in the position to obviously um, enact this um, into the council framework i just want to say thank you very much um, to you tina and your team and uh, everyone that's been involved in this because obviously there's quite a lot um, that's had to be considered um, so it is it is well appreciated thank you Right, so I need to get to the recommendations. Uh, oh. to to Tina, over to you first. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, so, yes, as uh, Councillor Smith says, this report um, sort of summarises the comprehensive preparations that we've been putting in place for the last two years now um, for our compliance with the new Social Housing Regulation Act 2023. Um, the Council have launched a programme around this which represents a significant transformation piece um, and the report details eight projects within that and as Council housing is not managed within one function within the Council you, you'll see in the report that all the relevant assistant directors and heads of service who've got responsibility for those revised consumer standards are set out within that framework. Um, we have also reflected in the report that the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Board um, will continue to support and oversee the preparedness for this work and there's details of the terms of reference that were discussed at their meetings in August and September for your approval um, and as you're aware following the leader's announcement back in June now our tenant consultative representatives sit as part of that to really influence and shape the work that we're doing around this and we're looking certainly as part of that transparency consumer standard to really support them in their ability to hold us and yourselves to account in terms of the delivery. Um, you'll also see in the report that there is a set of requirements around tenant satisfaction measures which we are required to 
um, share with the regulator from next April and that those themselves will also be shared through the various scrutiny committees and indeed that board for discussion and um, review. Um, we're also proposing tonight that we commission the tenant perception survey that is also required by the regulator which asks and we are required to ask key core questions around the services across council housing and that will draw out some of the um, challenges and opportunities around the service provision not least some of the key performance indicators that councillor summers alluded to earlier and that will in itself result in an action plan for improvement um, so as i said the program um, we've got external project support around that there's a whole infrastructure built around risk resource um, and compliance as you know from previous discussions we will see a shift to an inspection um, sort of approach by the regulator from next year um, they're going to be inspecting all providers of accommodation every four years we don't know where we'll be in that program at this stage we could be in the first year or in the fourth year but they're taking a risk-based approach to that through the ombudsman the building safety regulator and indeed the regulator themselves um, so this is high profile um, it does come with various risks in terms of um, any non-compliance there's all sorts of narrative around naming and shaming fining performance improvement planning and dare I say statutory appointments on boards and on um, councils sort of governance arrangements if you know if there's not satisfactory compliance so um, our executive leadership team are sponsoring it and you'll see from the recommendations that they're also going to be seeing quarterly reports in terms of performance so um, I recommend this to you um, and as I say it's been an ongoing conversation for the last couple of years thank you chair thank you for that um, yes um, I would like to say a big thank you again to to all the hard work and effort that you've put into this um, it is a big piece of work uh, it's required uh, and it's great to see that you know the, the the executive team and the leadership have actually got a, got ahead of the curve and it, you know, we, we, with the legislation that's coming down the line, hopefully we will be ready for that rather than trying to catch up. So it's a great piece of work. Yes, it's detailed, but be, being prepared rather than, you know, reacting to is always a good, uh, good position to be in. And, and I, I really do like the, um, the, the final recommendation that there is a, th a quarterly review on that program by the executive team. Because it is the you know the executive team that really have to make sure that the resources are are going to be required um, to deliver what government uh, will be asking us to do that. So great piece of work. Um, <coughs> before um, I, I move on, is, uh, to to ask for the recommendations uh, to be uh, moved and approved by cabinet. Uh, are any cabinet members want to discuss, comment, see anything? So uh, there are uh, five recommendations uh, which I'll just read out to approve the social housing programme as detailed in Annex 1 of this report. Um, detailing the, the programme highlight summary, eight um, associated projects and internal workshop as it, well, that was presented on the 4th of the 10th, 2023. Um, Recommendation 2.2 was to approve the terms of reference of the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Board. Uh, agreed on the 6th of the 9th, 23, with the portfolio, ho hold housing, portfolio Holder Housing and Planning in consultation with the Leader, leader of Labour and Independence and a member and of the Tenant Consultative Group uh, to endorse... The current performance set out in our tenant strategy measures to endorse the specification and procure specialist resource to undertake and compile the report on the tenant perception measurements and finally to endorse that quarterly review which i've just spoke about so it does actually give me great pleasure in recommending this to um to the to the committee uh, for moving and approving Move, approve all those in favor thank you
Uh, our next item, uh, we require that we will um, need to exclude the press uh, from this, so that I'll read that. In accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, England, regulation 2012 and section 100A, brackets 4, of the Local Government Act of 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves a lightly disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of the Schedule 12A of the Act, and that the public interest withholding the information outweighs the public interest of disclosing the information to the public. At this time, the agenda published represents... No, oh, I don't need to read that. So are we switched off? Can I move that? Second. All those in favour? 